So unless you've been living under a rock in the Christian circles the past several weeks, um, you know about the Asbury Revival that at least appears that it is spreading in many ways. And, and I've, we see it on different campuses and different churches. Um, and I, I hear a lot, I'm reading a lot about um, how to replicate that. Um, how to kickstart that in a church, in a group, and, and that's all good. I mean, that shows a desire among people to have revival. And the, just the conversations about that shows that, that God's people want revival in our nation, in our churches. But what I want to talk about is maybe a little different way to approach that. Instead of talking about how we can, can provide the right setting or do the right things in terms of creating an atmosphere among a group of people or whatever the case may be to sort of kickstart that. What I want to talk about this morning is preparing our hearts for revival, making sure that we are in a position, individually, each of us are in a position to the Holy Spirit doing a work to make sure that we are where we need to be to experience his power and to be used, to be available to be used by him in whatever way he chooses. We continue our series called Equip 23 where we are talking about spiritual gifts and we've explored the gifts individually. We've talked about what a spiritual gift is. We've talked about how to discover our gifts and how God wants to use our gifts. And today, we are talking about the issue of obedience. Next week, we'll close out with the the issue of surrender, two things that are vitally important. Now that we have the knowledge about spiritual gifts, we need to understand that in order for the Holy Spirit to, to work through us, there are two primary areas that we need to make sure we are willing to submit, and that is that we are willing to obey. Christ, that we are willing to follow where he leads, wherever he leads, and the Holy Spirit directs us, and also that we are willing to live each day and surrender, because that is a daily exercise, taking up our cross daily, counting the cost, and surrendering to our Lord and Savior. And the reason we're talking about spiritual gifts is because we want to help individuals, all of us, understand our gifts and how God uses them inside and outside of the church. Now, our response to the Holy Spirit's work in our life, in each of our lives, our response to that is either going to result in us seeing him working with power in and through us, or it can be the reason we are frustrated in our walk with Christ. Depending on how we respond to the Holy Spirit, will determine the outcome of our lives and how much or how little God uses us. The Holy Spirit desires and he deserves full and complete control of our lives. I mean, if we are Christians, if we have accepted salvation through Christ, then our lives belong to him. He paid for them with his life. Jesus did. And so he expects to have complete control of our lives, and he deserves it. But he does give us the choice as to whether or not we're going to surrender to him and follow him as he leads us and as he directs the course of our lives. And so even if the smallest part of my life is not surrendered to Christ, to the Holy Spirit, his work in my life, then his work can be derailed in my life. If I, if I hold back anything from him, his work can be derailed. Now, the Bible talks about being filled with the Spirit and the baptism of the Spirit, literally meaning immersed. And what those terms, there's a lot to it, but, but just for the purposes of this morning, those terms, what they're really referring to is the Holy Spirit's desire and the fact that he deserves to have complete control of my life. You know, I'm not going to truly be filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in my life when I'm saved, but I'm not going to be filled. I'm not going to be controlled by the Spirit unless I'm completely surrendered and obedient to Him. 
And so we're talking about the issue of obedience. Because when we fully realize that God, through His Spirit, is actively at work in our lives, our response should be all, holy all, in respect and reverence for Him and a willingness to obey. We look at, we're going to be in John chapter 14 this morning in a couple of different verses, but I want to read Philippians 2 verses 12 through 13 for you. Paul says this, he says, therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. God is at work in our lives for his purposes. Not my purposes, not your purposes, but his purposes. And the fact that that is true should cause a response of obedience and respect and reverence and amazement that God would choose to work through his people. So we're going to look at the different responses to the Holy Spirit this morning. And really, you can put them into two different categories, two main responses uh, to the Holy Spirit initiating a work in our lives. The first response is not a good one. It's rejection. Rejecting the Holy Spirit. And I'm talking about believers here, okay? I mean, there's certainly, and I believe, not everybody believes this, but I believe, and this will prove to you that I'm not a five-point Calvinist, Okay. I believe that a person can come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit who is lost and resist to that. Some people don't believe that, but I, I do believe that a person can reject. I believe I've seen that, witnessing to people under conviction, and they say no. Okay, now I don't know for sure because I'm not the Holy Spirit. I can't see in their hearts, but that's what I believe. What I'm talking about here is that, and I know this to be true, believers, once we have the Holy Spirit, once we are saved... And God wants to do a work through us. We can reject that if we choose. God gives us that choice. We can reject the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. We can refuse to surrender to the Spirit's work in our life. And so let's look at the negative responses to the Holy Spirit. The main, it's, it's all under the main umbrella of rejection, but what we're really talking about here is ways that we reject the Holy Spirit. One is that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about grieving the Spirit. If you look in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 and 31, Paul says, Do not grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by Him for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you, along with all malice. Simply put, bottom line, our sin grieves the Holy Spirit. When we, when we sin, we grieve God's Holy Spirit. When we show attitudes and actions that uh, are controlled by the flesh, because we still battle the flesh even though we're saved, when we succumb to that and we, we commit sin, we are grieving the Holy Spirit. And when those actions cause a break in fellowship with God, which they will, and a break in fellowship with other believers, that grieves the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit cannot lead us into fulfilling God's plan for us until we repent of whatever sin he's convicting us of. So there may need to be repentance that takes place in order for us to prepare our hearts to receive the Holy Spirit and for the Holy Spirit to work in and through us. And if there is sin that's present that, that... that you haven't repented of, you will not experience revival. You will not be able to use the gifts that God has given you properly until you've repented of that sin and turned away from that sin. So the Holy Spirit is going to convict us of sin if there is sin that needs to be confessed and repented of. He convicts us of sin because he loves us deeply. If he didn't care about us, he'd let us continue that destructive behavior. But he does love us, and he knows that whatever that sin is, is standing in the way of us experiencing his best for us, experiencing the fulfillment of his plan for us. So there may, may need to be confession and repentance. Think about this. Think, think about this statement, and I've said it a couple of times, but really think about this. Our sin grieves the Holy Spirit. It's not that God is some mean, vindictive being that's just waiting to punish us for our sin. Our sin breaks his heart. It grieves him. 
And that truth alone should motivate us to deal with it and to get rid of it because he's provided a way for us to get rid of it. Now, it's hard. We hold on to those things because some of those things make us feel good temporarily. Some of those things mean we have to humble ourselves and we have to be vulnerable before God and before others. But it grieves his heart. And if he's calling us to confess, we need to confess. Why? Because sin will rob us of God's best and it will rob others of God's best through us. It will hinder our ability to experience his power, his presence, and his work through us as he desires to do. We also reject the Spirit by resisting the Spirit. Another way we reject him is simply resisting. Stephen told the people in Acts 7.51, You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, You are always resisting the Holy Spirit as your ancestors did. You do also. So when our sin grieves the Holy Spirit, he immediately brings conviction. But when he brings our sin to light, urging us to repent of that sin, we can resist him. When God leads us in a particular direction, when he calls us to step out in faith, may not have anything to do with the sin that he's convicting us, But we can resist stepping out in faith, which becomes the sin of disobedience. But we can resist the Holy Spirit. God is not going to force you to follow him. We can resist his Holy Spirit. We can refuse to admit sin or just, you know, call it something that makes us feel better about it. You know, downplay it, soft pedal its name. We can refuse to face that sin. We can resist his work to make us holy and acceptable to God. And as a result, become disqualified for service because we're not willing to submit to the process of sanctification, becoming more like Christ. Maybe the most common form of resistance that we see in our society and in the Western culture, the Western Christian culture, is complacency. We're just comfortable, and we like being comfortable, and we don't want to be taken out of our comfort zones, and we're just fine where we are. But when God speaks, the issue is not open for discussion. For the believer, when God speaks, there are two choices. There's obedience and disobedience, and you've heard me say this before, and I'm sure it's not original to me, but I've been saying it a long time, so I'll claim it. Um, There is no such thing as hesitation and obedience. Or partial obedience. Any hesitation is disobedience. When God speaks, we either obey or we resist. And resistance is disobedience. But we have a choice to make. He calls us to act. He calls us to trust him. Which means we have to take a step of faith. Won't always know where that foot's going to land. But we have to trust him. And so we have a decision to make. Will we follow or will we not? Will we hesitate? which in fact is disobedience. And one of the reasons we resist the work of the Holy Spirit is that we're comfortable. Another reason is that he often speaks through other people. You know, a convicting word in a sermon or a small group Bible study or a close personal friend who is your accountability person who speaks truth into your life. And when that truth comes through that other person, sometimes it's difficult to receive. That that can can affect our pride because we have to be willing to admit a failure or admit that we're wrong. And the result is because of pride, we can struggle with that. But Jesus said this in John 13, verse 20, Truly I tell you, whoever whoever receives anyone I send receives me. And the one who receives me receives him who sent me. So we refuse to hear a corrective word from whoever God has placed in our lives. We resist that. We are unwilling to admit our failure or to adjust our lives according to the godly instruction that we are receiving. And the result is that it hinders the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we are not in a position to experience his power, the power of revival, the power of him working through us, using the gifts that he's given us. We're not in a position to hear him at all because we are resisting what he's trying to tell us. And many times in our lives, we are sitting there saying, God, I just wish you would speak. Why don't I hear you? And he's going, I already spoke to you and you're not listening. 
You're not receiving it. I've shared with you what you need to know to move forward, but I'm not receiving it. I'm not listening. I'm not willing to adjust. I'm not willing to repent. And we're resisting God's Spirit. And then there's the possibility of quenching the Spirit. And all of these, you know, these can, can, can overlap and be connected, but there are a lot of ways that we can quench the Spirit in our lives. Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 22. He said, do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine er- everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good and abstain from evil. When the fire of the Spirit is burning, when, when the Holy Spirit is working, it, it's very easy as Christians to pour water on that fire. We can, we can pour cold water on it in a minute. The what-ifs. And the problems that may come. And how is this going to work? I don't see it. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough people. There are any number of ways we can pour water on the fire of the Holy Spirit as he is burning and working through his church. A selfish comment. A carnal comment. I mean, words, as James talks about, words have power. And, And just simple Phrases, simple things that we say can quench the spirits working in our lives and in our church. We pray for revival. We pray for a move. And a lot of people are right now, and I'm thankful for that. We're seeing revival in many places in our country. I've shared with you, I believe God is beginning a great work in this church, a revival in this church. We pray for it. But then so many times when the spirit begins to move, we miss it. Or we're unreceptive because it disrupts our lives and we don't like that. Or it's outside of our ability to control or comprehend and we don't like that. It calls us to step out into an area that we don't know and we don't understand and trust God in ways that we never have before. And instead of looking back and seeing his faithfulness and and looking at where we've experienced his power and faithfulness, we... In stepping out in faith, we refuse to do that because of fear or complacency or sin or or whatever it is that we need to deal with before we're able to experience his best. We want conviction amongst the lost, but we're resistant when he calls us to repentance. We think about how the church will be blessed, but then he takes the church in that direction and we're uncomfortable with it, whatever it is. And because the Spirit doesn't come in the way that we think, We resist him and we turn from his work. But if the Holy Spirit is truly God, and I mean this, and listen, this is hard, okay? I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm called to lead my family, I'm called to lead a church, and so many times I catch myself trying to figure it out myself and trying to tell God what to do and how those things should go. But if we really believe the Holy Spirit is God, we have no right to tell him how to work in our lives and in our church because it's his church and it's his life. My family is his. This church is his. My life is his. And if I really believe that he's God, I have to believe that he knows what's best. And so when he calls and when he moves, I have to be willing to say yes wherever that leads, wherever he's leading. But we have a choice. We can either accept or we can reject. So it's important to respond properly to the Holy Spirit and how he's working in our lives. Serving God is not a right. It's a privilege. I'm going to say that again. Serving God is not a right. We don't deserve it. We haven't earned it. It's a privilege. It's grace. It's a gift that we do not deserve. God wants to work through us, but he will not work through an unholy vessel that's unwilling to submit to him, that is willing to resist him. We have to be willing to yield to his Holy Spirit. Hudson Taylor said this. He said, God gives his Holy Spirit not to those who long for him, not to those who pray for him, Those things are important. Not to those who desire to always be filled. There are a lot of people who are are in that place right now. He gives his spirit to those who obey. I can say all day I want the Holy Spirit. I can pray for revival all day long. 
I can beg the Holy Spirit to work in my life. But when he does begin a work, if I'm not willing to obey, none of those things mean anything. Are we willing to obey? Because there's one choice in responding to the Holy Spirit. We can reject him, but then there's another choice. And in case you haven't noticed, this is the one that I recommend. (laughs) It's obedience. That's the second choice. We can reject the Holy Spirit or we can obey when he calls. And that's the way that we put ourselves in a position to experience his power and work through us. If we really want revival in this church, if we want revival in our lives, if we want to see him do a work that he's never done in this church before, in this community, in our nation, then we have to be willing to obey. And we can't wait until he calls to make up our minds as to whether or not we're going to obey, because if we do, we'll find an excuse not to. We have to make up in our hearts and our minds that we have submitted to him. God, wherever you lead, I will follow. We have to surrender, which we'll talk more about next week. Obedience, the power of the Holy Spirit will be seen. Here's the thing, though. When you step out, when he calls you to step out in faith, if you take that step, you won't get all the answers to where you're going, but you will experience his power at the first step of obedience. I've experienced that in my life. When we allow Jesus to function as Lord of our life, our lives, and the Spirit to act freely in our lives, to do his work in us and through us, the difference will become obvious to us and the people around us. Life will no longer consist of just simply doing good works for God, doing good things for him. Instead, the Christian life will be an exciting adventure, not always good, not always pleasant, but an exciting adventure of walking in the presence of God. And it's an adventure that you don't want to miss. When I was in the eighth grade, our youth group took a trip to Point Mallard. Many of you have been to Point Mallard. At that time, if you've been there, you know they've got the Olympic-sized swimming pool with the platforms, right? Right now, there are only two platforms open. The third platform has been closed for years because somebody got wise and decided that was not a good thing to let people like crazy eighth graders jump off the third platform. But at that time, it was still open. And I was young in the youth group, and there were some older guys there, and everybody was talking. I'd never been there before, and everybody was talking about it on the way up there in the van, the church van. And I'm going to jump off the third platform. I've done it before. It's awesome. And so peer pressure, I was like, sure, I'll do it. I'll jump up there. I'll jump off of there. And when you get there, and if you've been there, you see it from the ground, it looks high. But let me tell you, it looks a whole lot higher when you get up there. I remember climbing the ladder, getting to the second platform. And and there's a pretty big difference between the second and third platform, by the way. And I remember, and I was never really afraid of heights. I am more now than I used to be. I think that's just because I'm I'm grown and I have better sense. But I've never been afraid of heights. But I remember getting up there. And climbing up there and getting to the top and thinking, what in the world did I get myself into? I was terrified. But I stood up there and all my friends down at the bottom, and I'd seen people climb down. And I made up my mind, there is no way I'm climbing back down this this ladder to the embarrassment, to the ridicule of all of my friends, okay? I remember standing on the edge of that platform. And everybody looking like little ants down. And the pool not looking big enough to catch me when I jumped. But I remember standing on the edge of that third platform. And all I had to do, makes it sound easy, was take a step. That's all I had to do. And my heart raced. I was terrified. But finally, I got up enough courage and I took that step. It was terrifying. But it was also exhilarating. It was the wind rushing and all, my heart racing and all, not fearing I'm not going to be able to control myself. All of those things that made it terrifying also made it one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had. It was exciting. It was an adventure. And when I got back, when I got to the bottom, I sure was glad I took that step. Not just because, you know, my friends couldn't make fun of me for climbing down. That was part of it, if I'm honest. But because I got to experience that. But had I not taken that step, 
I never would have known what that felt like. That's the Christian life right there. If we refuse to take the step of faith, when God calls us to step out, we'll never know what it's like to experience his power and his presence in our lives. We can be believers and walk casually through life and never really experience God work in a miraculous way through our lives. Or we can step out in faith and experience his power in incredible ways that can only be explained by his presence in us and working through us. So let's choose to obey. What are the results of that? There are, a lot, there are several characteristics of walking in the Spirit, obeying Christ. One is satisfaction with Christ. We find out that he's all that we need and that he is sufficient and that he will provide. We don't always know how he's going to provide. We don't know. I mean, those of you that are in these groups tonight, I've had conversations with you through the week, and there's one theme running through all of it, and I share this, this feeling We don't know exactly where this is going to go. We don't know exactly what God's going to do through this. And that's scary. As a leader, that's scary. Those of you who are leading and participating, that's scary. But we do believe that God is in this and working through this. And he is sufficient. And what we will find is satisfaction as we walk through this together if we trust him. And if we continue to obey him, there is satisfaction when we walk in the spirit, using our gifts for God's glory and his kingdom. We have to be satisfied with Christ, though. It can't be Jesus plus. It has to be him. It has to be the Holy Spirit. He has to be enough for us. If not, we're going to constantly be thinking of ourselves and our personal needs and what we don't have, and we'll be discontent. We won't be content with him and what he's doing in our lives. We'll always be thinking about what could be or what we should be doing or what other people are doing. We won't be satisfied with what he is doing. Jesus said in John 4, 14, if whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. A relationship with Jesus satisfies doesn't mean that you'll have a problem-free life. You won't. I mean, if you want examples of that, there are plenty of testimonies for those of us who have walked with the Lord for any length of time. You won't be problem-free. In this world, you will have trouble, Jesus said. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be uh, heartache. There's going to be tragedy. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be all of those things. But you will find satisfaction and contentment in the midst of all of that because you will have joy that's not dependent upon circumstances or emotions. And the Holy Spirit is the key to that. Living in obedience, following Him, accepting the direction that He's leading, repenting, confessing, obedience. That's the key to to knowing that Christ is present in your life, to feeling and hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. Jesus also said this in John chapter 37, verse 30, 30, or John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within. He satisfies. And John tells us what Jesus was talking about in verse 39. He said this about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit, for the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. John is saying, we didn't understand then, but we now know what he was talking about, and we've experienced it, and he was telling the truth. Jesus satisfies. His Holy Spirit satisfies. Because the Holy Spirit, the way this works is, and there's a lot I don't know about the Trinity, but the way this works is the Holy Spirit applies in my life, in your life, all that Jesus accomplished through his death and resurrection. That's the application. The Holy Spirit works through us. We experience a relationship with God. The Holy Spirit works in us, speaks to us, communicates to us. We experience God's work in our lives because the Holy Spirit is working through us. We have fellowship with other believers that's uncommon, a love that is not human because it's the Holy Spirit working in and through us. It's his love. 
And that's all possible. Those are all things we can't experience without salvation, without Jesus' death and his resurrection. But because he did that, we experience those things. But we have to be willing to obey. We have to be willing to follow. And if we are, we will experience those things. Once you recognize your need, as when you're lost and as a believer, when there's a need, Jesus says, come to me. Come to me and drink. You'll find satisfaction. Not to anyone else, not to a church. He doesn't say, come to church and you'll be satisfied. There is satisfaction in that, but only if the Holy Spirit's running the show. He doesn't say, come to church. He, gave, he, he doesn't say, join a noble cause. He doesn't say, come to a particular individual. What he says is, come to me. He gave his life so that you and I can be filled with his spirit. He laid aside his glory temporarily so that you and I could be filled with his Holy Spirit. He prayed so that you and I could be filled with his Holy Spirit. He died on the cross, a gruesome death, so that you and I could be filled with his Holy Spirit. And he ascended to heaven and sent his Holy Spirit so that you and I could be filled with the Holy Spirit. He did all of that so that we could be filled. He's prepared everything necessary to fill your life and my life with living waters that satisfy forever. He's done everything necessary for us to experience that. But in his infinite wisdom, he doesn't force that on us. He leaves the decision up to us. Even after we are saved, he leaves the decision to us as to whether or not we will accept it. And the way we accept that is through obedience. But when we do... We find satisfaction. Jesus says, come and drink and you will be satisfied. And when we do drink, when we obey, when we receive, we find satisfaction. And then satisfaction with Christ will lead to dissatisfaction with self. Now, what I'm, not talking, what I, what I'm talking about here is not low self-esteem or hating yourself. That's not what I'm talking about. You were created in the image of God. God wanted a you with your personality and all of the things that we've talked about that make up your gifting, your shape, all of those things, okay? But what I am talking about is a dissatisfaction with the flesh. Because the more of Christ I experience and the more of his goodness and doing things his way and the satisfaction that we just talked about, the more I'm going to hate the flesh. And I'm going to distance myself from that. I'm going to resist the flesh by his power and strength. Because what we experience is that as we run this race and, and experience sanctification, what we see is that we learn more about Jesus. And the more of Jesus we learn, the more of him that we know, the more we want to know. We become satisfied in Christ. And the more we experience that satisfaction, the less we want of anything else that offers satisfaction but always comes up short. And that is the flesh. It will never completely satisfy. So we want to be sanctified. We want to be holy and acceptable to God. And, and we want to distance ourselves from those things, the flesh. And so we, we continue that process of putting off the old self, as Scripture tells us, and putting on the new self. That's sanctification, becoming more like Christ. Because we find increasing satisfaction in Him. And we become increasingly dissatisfied with self, with the flesh. And this dissatisfaction will lead to the next result, which is a hunger to know Christ more. The more we know of him, the more we want to know of him. And through the Holy Spirit's presence in my life, in your life, you're going to discover that Jesus is real and he is personal. He's not a distant God who doesn't care. He is a God who loves you personal, relational, who wants to be involved in every detail of your life, which, may, which is why we have to submit every detail of our lives to him. And the Spirit continues to uncover the riches of who Jesus is as we grow in him. And our mind is filled with thoughts about Christ. Our conversations are filled with Jesus 
Our time is spent with him in Bible study, in quiet time. And as we walk through the day, we live in communion with him. Because the more we experience that, the more he reveals himself to us, the more we want that. We want him. We desire him. And then we'll be able to say, just like Paul did to the Christians in Philippi, Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm alive, I get to experience you more. But if I die, I get to experience you fully, perfectly. And then we'll also agree with him when he says this in Philippians 3, verses 8 through 10. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own, he's saying I'm I'm learning what true righteousness is. A Pharisee who thought he knew righteousness, he's saying I know righteousness now, what true righteousness is. Not of a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. And by the way, faith is not just believing, it's obeying too. That's what he's saying here. My goal is to know him. And the power of his resurrection. He's saying, as long as I'm alive, I want to know more. I want Jesus more. More of Christ. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Being conformed to his death. The more we know of him, the more we want to know him. The more we experience him, the more we want to experience him. And the more we become like him, the more we want to become like him. A hunger for Jesus Christ. And then... We see another characteristic, which is easy for all to see, and that's a love for God's people. If I'm walking in the Spirit, I will have a love for God's people. And we'll always seek to build up the body. Remember, spiritual gifts, well, the primary purposes of spiritual gifts, the reason the Holy Spirit gives them to us is to build up the body of Christ, to honor God and to build up His church. To use, to build up the body. That will be a truly a desire of of us. We will have that desire if we are walking in obedience to the Spirit. And Jesus gave his life for his church, for his bride. The Spirit isn't given to the individual alone. He gives it to all of us, to all believers, to be used for his glory and to draw us together for his glory. To strengthen and build up the church. Look at Ephesians 4, 7. We've spent a good bit of time in Ephesians 4 in this series. Verse 7, now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift to all of us. And then verse 11, he gave, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, various gifts to all, all believers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to build up the body of Christ. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with the stature measured by Christ's fullness, more of Christ, growth. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. We'll be grounded. We'll know the truth. We won't be deceived. But speaking the truth in love. Let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. And one of the clearest evidences of a spirit-filled life is a person's interdependence upon within the church with God's people. It's how much we depend on Christ and how much we are bonded together by the love of Christ. We need each other. This is how God designed it. He put us together for a purpose, for a reason. This local church, the church as a whole, but this local church, we are here put together for a purpose. And we are bonded by the Holy Spirit. A believer who's walking in the Spirit will love God and love his bride. will love the family of God. And they will, we will use our gifts for his glory to strengthen and build up the body of Christ. Paul said this in Romans 12, 5, In the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We are members of the body of Christ and we are members of each other. We are connected. 
Someone who's filled with the Spirit cannot stand outside and watch from a distance. You're saying a Christian can't do that? No. Someone who is truly filled with the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, in obedience to the Spirit, cannot stand outside and watch from a distance. And you can be inside and still be outside, by the way. You can be a spectator and not a participator. Someone who's truly filled with the Spirit is connected and using the gifts that the Spirit has given him or her to serve the body of Christ. The words of John say it all. 1 John three sixteen. This is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. What should our response be? We should lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. The love of God. The evidences of obedience. It's visible. It's, it's even people who don't know what it is. See it. And they see the work of God through us. And I want to show you an example or an analogy, I guess, of what I... This, this looks like. I brought with me some milk and some chocolate syrup. If only I can get it open. <laughs> Nobody has any idea what I'm going to make, right? It's a grand mystery. But I kept it in here so it would be cold. Hopefully I won't make a mess. But right now it's just milk. Skim milk, but milk nonetheless. Did I hear a yuck? <laughs> heard a yuck. I, I've, I've grown to like it, Okay. But I've got skim milk. I've got some chocolate syrup here. And in order to make chocolate milk, what do I got to do? All right. Annie, you want to come make your secret chocolate milk? She has a secret recipe. I'm I'm kidding. You can tell me if I'm making it right. All right. Is that enough? She said no. We're going to say that's enough, okay? But right now, you really can't see it. I mean, if you're, maybe if you look on the bottom, you'll see it's there. But it's not chocolate milk yet. I mean, you can't see it. I mean, technically, I guess it's chocolate milk. It's got chocolate in it, but you can't see it. So, so what has to happen for, it, for you really to be able to see and taste and tell that it's chocolate milk? You got to mix it together, all right? I brought a spoon. I plan ahead. So I'm going to stir it up. And now you begin to see the change, right? I don't know, Annie. I put a lot in here. Now... You can tell that it's chocolate milk. You can see it in the color, what it looks like, and yeah, yeah. (laughs) You can taste it, too. But something had to happen. It was in there, and if I had taken a drink with it in there and then at the bottom, it would not have tasted. I might have got a little hint of chocolate, but not like that. I think you would approve, Anna Shirley. It's chocolatey. It's evident. Obedience is how the Holy Spirit becomes evident in our lives. Submission and obedience. It activates his power in our life. God doesn't force us. It's just like stirring up that chocolate. The Holy Spirit's there. When you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, he enters your life at the point of confession and repentance. When you receive salvation, you receive the Holy Spirit. But just because you have it doesn't mean it's going to be evident to the people around you. The only way you truly experience the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit is through obedience. If I'm willing to obey, if I'm willing to submit, then I'll experience Him in my life. And it will taste good. And it will be satisfying. I'm not quite as hungry as I was. That's mean, isn't it? (laughs) It will be satisfying. It will be satisfying to you, and it will be satisfying to the other believers who are serving alongside you, and it will be satisfying to those who come to know Christ because of your witness and because of the work he's doing through you and through us. So the question, do other people know that the Holy Spirit exists in your life? God wants revival in our country, I believe. He wants revival in this church. Are we in a position to experience that? We can pray all day long. We can have all the services that we want. We can talk about it as much as we want. We can be in awe of where it's happening in our country. But if we're not prepared for it ourselves, we'll never experience it. Are we prepared? I believe God is doing a new thing here. 
I believe God is preparing us for a big thing here in this church and in this community to make an impact like we've never seen. Are we prepared for it? Let's pray together. Lord, if there's sin that needs to be confessed, I pray that we will confess it, repent of it, turn from it. If there's resistance in any way, I pray that we would submit. If we're rejecting you in any way, Holy Spirit, as you choose to move in and through us, I pray that we would be obedient and receive what you're trying to do, that we would submit and allow you to have complete control. It's a grand mystery why you give us the choice to reject you, other than that gives us the ability to have true relationship with you. I understand that, but you allow us to reject you, even as your followers. But I pray right now that each of us, we would search our hearts. Holy Spirit, you would search our hearts. And however you lead us to respond, Lord, I pray that we would respond in obedience. Whether that's you convicting someone in this room for the first time of their sin and their need for salvation, I pray that they would open their lives, their hearts up to you and receive that gift that only you can give and come during this time of decision and allow me to share with them what they need to do next to receive and experience salvation. For those of us who know you, I pray that we would respond, receive and respond to you, Holy Spirit, as you lead us. That we would determine in our hearts that we are going to follow you. We are going to obey wherever you lead. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand for our time of commitment?